Essentially what it showed was that people in the lower protein group ate more calories per day. And the reason is, is they said that they just weren't as satiated. So it's interesting because it just hypothesized that the people in the lower protein group may actually gain more weight, add more weight and lead to particular issues. But there's another study that's looking at the exact opposite side saying that's not necessarily true. Let's take a look at that right now. All right, everybody, we are back. Excited to get into our Total Wellness Tuesday show here on the Cabral Concept. Today is a fun and special show. I always love to be able to bring you both sides of the equation. That means there's a lot of people out there right now saying eat as much protein as you can in one day or at least one gram per pound of body weight. I brought you a lot of the science actually behind that. That was on episode 2854. But I also want to bring you a flip side. And this article was actually just written about 12 days ago, maybe two weeks maximum. And it's actually the rebuttal to the protein leverage theory. So remember the hypothesis of the theory, If and I, I would love you to go back and listen to episode 2854, but if you don't, just a quick synopsis is they did a small study, they looked at a 10% macro, so 10% of your diet coming from protein, and then they looked at another group that had 25% of their macros coming from protein. So 25% of a, let's say, 2,000 calorie diet is 500 calories a day, and when you do the math on that, that's what, about 125 grams of protein or so per day, because you just multiply by four. In this particular study, it was exactly 138 grams of protein per day versus 66 grams of protein per day. One, very much on the lower side. The other one, I would say more moderate to high, depending on who you are. Now, again, back in my day, in my early 20s, I was trying to do natural bodybuilding. I weighed about 35 more pounds of basically more muscle than I had right now, and I was eating 275 grams of protein or more per day. So I get it. I understand how people can like look at this from different sides of the equation, but essentially what it showed was that people in the lower protein group ate more calories per day, on average 260 calories more per day than the 25% protein group. And the reason is, is they said that they just weren't as satiated. So it's interesting because the it, it just hypothesized that the people in the lower protein group may actually gain more weight, add more weight, and lead to particular issues. But there's another study that's looking at the exact opposite side saying that's not necessarily true. Let's take a look at that right now. So I will link up, of course, to all the research at stephencabral.com slash 2874, which is today's show. All right, so let's get right to it on that uh, particular one. We're looking at cutting back uh, on a specific amino acid, one of the most abundant amino acids. It's called a branch chain amino acid. Um, actually can extend lifespan up to 33%. So let's go into it, and now I'm going to show you exactly why this would be considered a rebuttal. All right, so a new study in mice, yes, it was done in mice, uh, found limited intakes of one particular essential amino acid showed or slowed the impact of aging and even lengthened the lifespan. Scientists are now wondering if these findings could help people improve their longevity and quality of life. Isoleucine is one of the three branch chain amino acids we use to build proteins in our body. It's essential for our survival, but since our cells can't produce it from scratch, we have to get it from sources like eggs and dairy and proteins and meat. But there can always be too much of a good thing. Earlier research using data from 2016 to 2017 uh, in a survey of Wisconsin residents found dietary leucine levels were linked with metabolic health and that people with higher BMIs were, were generally consuming greater quantities of the amino acid. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So we'll put a little pin in that. Because this study is fairly short, so I'm just going to read it to you. Different components of your diet have value and impact beyond their function as a calorie. We've been digging in on one component that many people may be eating too much of. It's interesting and encouraging to think a dietary change could still make such a big difference in lifespan and what we call health span, even when started closer to midlife. A genetically diverse group of mice was fed either a diet containing 20 common amino acids as a control, a diet where all amino acids were reduced by about two-thirds, or a diet where only isoleucine was reduced by the same amount. 
The mice were around six months old at the start of the study, which is about the equivalent, so this is really important, six month old mice or mouse is the equivalent to about a 30 year old person, all right? They could eat as much as they wanted, but only from the specific kind of food provided to that group, which is why it's much easier doing a study in mice than it is in humans. So restricting dietary isoleucine increased the lifespan and health span of the mice, reduced their frailty, and promoted leanness and glycemic control. Male mice had their lifespans increased 33% compared to those whose isoleucine was not restricted. And females had a 7% increase. These mice also scored better in 26 measures of health, including muscle strength, endurance, blood sugar levels, tail use, and hair loss. The male mice in this group had less age-related prostate enlargement and were less likely to develop the cancerous tumors that are common in the diverse mice strains. Curiously, the mice given low isoleucine food also ate significantly more calories than others. Make a note of that, pin that one as well. But rather than gaining weight, they actually burned more energy and maintained leaner body weights even though their activity levels were no different. Wow, that's all to say to that, let's keep on going. The researchers think restricting isoleucine in humans, either by diet or pharmaceutical means, has the potential to yield similar anti-aging effects. Although, as with all my studies, we won't know for sure until it's actually tested in humans. This is easier said than done. Although the food provided to the mice was controlled, the researchers noted that diet is an incredibly complex chemical reaction, and there may be other dietary components involved in producing these results. Restricting protein in general, sorry, restricting protein in general, for instance, can have detrimental effects on the body, mouse or human. Translating this research for real-world human use, use is more complicated than just reducing high-protein foods, even though that's the simplest way to limit isoleucine. All right, that is it. A remarkable study. I pulled a few things from this. So the first, obviously, it's a mouse-based study. Totally get it. And it's also a survey done for Wisconsin residents in terms of metabolic health. But okay, we can honestly... If you want to say, I don't believe in surveys for research, we're just going to throw it all up. But that's fine. I think there's I think there's absolutely valid research in surveys. I wouldn't make it the end all be all, but certainly I think that surveys are valid. Okay. So having said that, let's just not even say that the Wisconsin residents who, let's say, had more protein intake, had higher BMIs, uh, and like they're potentially more health-based issues. Okay, let's take that out. If we just look at the particular mouse-based study, what I found to be very interesting is that one is they could actually keep their protein fairly high or at least moderately high while reducing higher L uh, isoleucine foods. How do you do that? Well, really difficult, still eating meat, fish, and eggs. And I can do a follow-up uh, podcast. If you're interested, just let me know in the podcast. Uh, li literally, let me know in the comments below. Do you want me to do a podcast on lowering, keeping protein high, but lowering isoleucine foods? And I'd be happy to do that. So just let me know. So here's the interesting thing. Um, they, You are able to still lower isoleucine and keep protein fairly high. But would this be then detrimental, uh, specifically supplementing with a high meat diet or a higher branch chain amino acid supplement? And the answer would most likely be yes. Now, again, this isn't definitive research, right? I'm just sharing with you preliminary research, just like the protein theory or protein leverage theory was preliminary research as well. Now, what the protein leverage hypothesis did not say, though, is whether the people who added 260 calories more on average per day gained more weight and had blood sugar issues. Well, if you base it on this particular study, believe it or not, the increase in calories did not lead to detrimental health effects, and it didn't even lead to higher BMIs or weight gain in general. And the increased calorie, there wasn't more activity levels. So that to me, I would love to see follow-up studies. How can someone on a lower protein diet increase carbs, not gain weight, and not have any health-based issues while not increasing their activity level? Pretty remarkable. 
I mean, I, I find that to be pretty remarkable. I think we need more research on it. But also, I hearken back to the blue zones, right? So the longest lived people in the world, you can come up with any diet you want. And honestly, I've always said that I'm agnostic when it comes to diets, like I really am. It's just when I look at the research from an unbiased perspective, meaning like I'm not the keto guy, I'm not the carnivore guy, I'm not the high carb guy, I'm not any of those things. When I look at it, I'm like, oh, you know, the average longest lived people in the world, their protein is somewhere around 10% to maybe 15% upper um, upper levels. Uh, I look at it as like 50 to 60%, sometimes even more carbs, and then the rest around 30% or so um, coming from fat. And again, I'm not telling you that's what you should do specifically for your diet, but when I look at those populations like across the world, it's not just like, oh, these people in Sardinia, oh, these individuals in Loma Linda, California. No, it's, it's literally all over the world, Costa Rica, Greece, uh, Italy, California in the US, it's looking at these populations that seem to outlive everybody else by a factor of like 30%, which is enormous. It's like 20 years, right, on average, or at least a decade. So when you look at this and you also look at health span, which is the number of years you stay healthy, not just the number of years you're alive, which is lifespan, protein, at least dietary wise, seems to be a factor. And they do, they are a little bit more plant based. Now, I will say that none of the longest lived people, except those studied in Loma Linda who were Seventh-day Adventists or they were more vegan-based, all the rest included meat and fish or something like that in their diet. So I'm also not telling you that you can't eat meat and fish. All I try to go by is the literal science that we have. And the understanding is coming to about, again, so what happens in the real world always happens first, right? And we know that with Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and much more. And then eventually the science catches up is to tell us why. Well, what I find to be fascinating, because I've gone through many, many studies before, is that at least some of our protein should come from plant-based foods. It doesn't all have to come from plant-based foods. I know that people, you know, they love their meat, they love their fish, whatever. I, I do too. So it's not saying that I don't. It's just I don't treat protein or food as a point of, you know, contingency to, to battle against another person or debate against them. I'm not, the debate is always how it should always be, how can we best help people, right? How can we help them to live their longest, healthiest life? And that's what the question should always be. So when I look at this research, I'm not afraid to give you both sides of the equation. And I will let you know that at least in my practice, I have seen the best body transformation results go with a higher protein diet, okay? And I've seen the best, at least overall health into uh, later years, more of not low protein, but lower protein, okay? And then you might say, well, is there an in-between? That's what we're looking at right now. And that might be a moderate level protein diet, maybe 20% of macros, but trying to lower some of these isoleucine foods. That's where I seem to be falling into right now. But again, I'm always keeping an open mind on the latest and greatest anti-aging based science, longevity science, and not being too quick to jump on any one diet plan. Because when I look at, again, the totality of people that have come before us and the longest lived people in the world, this is what they were eating. This is how they were moving their bodies. And I would also say when they begin to switch to more of a Western standard American diet, that's when we see things start to go downhill. Does that mean it's the processed food, the processed carbs? Does it mean that it's more of the fried oils? Maybe it's both. Does it also mean less plant-based proteins and more meat? I don't know. Again, I'm not saying to totally get rid of your meat, your fish, those types of things, but I will say based on a lot of research, we may wanna to begin to limit them, not cut them out completely, but limit them to not eating them, let's say for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Maybe it's one meal a day. That's more where we're going to, we're earning the side of caution and playing it safe. Is it the best body transformation? Probably not. I will agree with you that if your number one goal is to get lean and put on muscle, yeah, I'd go with a one for one, like one gram of protein per pound of body weight or ideal body weight. I'd probably stay closer to that because I've seen that work 
mark over the past 25 years. But if you're looking to move more towards anti-aging longevity and your number one goal isn't body transformation, I'd start to move a little bit closer, um, again, towards maximum of 20% of your macros uh, coming from protein. But again, I'm not here to tell you exactly what diet is right for you. What I wanna do is bring the research to you and I know that over time you're gonna be able to find that right nutrition plan for you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna link up this uh, new and I think exciting research. I love looking at new research like this. This was published in Cell Metabolism. I'll link that up for you. You can check it out. I would love to hear from you in the comments and if you'd like me to do a show on keeping protein up but reducing isoleucine, just let me know as well below. Take care, everybody. Have an amazing rest of the day. The research links will be at stephencabral.com slash 2874. Feel free to share the show with anyone you believe it could serve. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.